All right, good morning, everyone. It's a very small stage. My chance of staying up here for long is zero. Okay, so uh, I know everybody's here to talk about money, and we're gonna do that. But first, I wanna give a little bit of background on me is I started working in the home service industry. I can't take it up there, guys, I'm sorry. I started working in the home service industry at 15. Uh, basically been a technician in some way, shape, or form almost all of my life. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about my first job. I was not a great student in school. Uh, they said I was rambunctious, I think was the term, right? Uh, I've been a home service technician, VP of operations at a global manufacturing plant where we also had uh, technicians worldwide. I ran those guys too. And then now entrepreneur, business coach, Huff Super Tech University and Larry, everybody say hi to Larry. Larry's my, co Larry's my college roommate. We've been business partners for a lot of years. We have the Blue Collar Nation podcast. All right, I have a book, it just came out. This is the first real day of it. So if anybody wants to buy a book, come by the booth later, happily sign it. And in that, I've built multiple seven figure businesses. In that, there's a roadmap, right? There's something that we all need to know how to do. And a lot of us just get stuck because as the owners, we keep trying to do everything ourselves and we never get past that point. So we hit a lid and then we get stuck. And now all of a sudden we have to get employees and all the things, right? And I can't talk about every single thing in that booth. Does anybody else know that nice lady there? It's Katie Harris, Spot on Solutions. Most of you know her. Katie wrote the, all the marketing portions of this book as well. So good book, so stop by. Um, we can't hit every topic, but we're gonna talk about money, raising average tickets, right? So if we're a carpet cleaning company, and we have two vans. We only have so much bandwidth in those two vans. We only have so many hours. So we have to maximize how much we can make off each of those vans as they're out in the field, right? What's that gonna take? It's gonna take our team, because it's not gonna be just us. It's gonna be our technicians. Do technicians generally love to sell? No. We have to help them along the way, train them, right? So we're gonna talk a little bit about that today. And also, Larry and I started our clean and restoration business on January 2nd, 2008, in the Inland Empire of California, which was very hit, hard hit by the recession. And we learned really quickly that every single phone call mattered. And every single dollar that we could get out of the few phone calls that we were getting was going to make us survive. So guess what happened? We learned real quick that we needed to raise the average ticket on every job. Look guys, I'm not saying we're in 2008, but you guys probably all feel it. There's a little more price resistance going on right now when you go out in the field. So we need to train our team to be able to overcome that. Okay, so we got to make every opportunity count. But before we do that, I'm aging myself. Let's step back 42 years. So if you do the math, I started home services at 15. You add 42 to that, and that equals old, right? 57. But my intro to home services was at a company called Chrisman Pool Service. Now, in the pool service industry, most vendors have like one or two trucks. It's a very chuck in a truck kind of industry. But I had the good fortune of working at Chrisman Pool for a gentleman named Dick Chrisman. Dick was an accountant by trade. And what he did was he had a pool service company that couldn't pay the bill. And he said, instead of paying the bill, why don't you give me the company? I'll go run it myself. So he took over the company with not a contractor's mindset, but a business mindset. And that's a very different thing. I had the good fortune at 15 years old to start working for Dick. They have 55 trucks and 75 employees in, the, in a state with a population of about a million, right? They are probably one of the best pool service companies in the country. And this is what I learned from Dick Christman as a 15 year old and it's carried through my entire career. We had the Christman Pool Code of Conduct, right? And we will get to show you how to build a brand where you can basically charge whatever you want, right? Neat uniforms, we had to be in uniform all the time. Clean trucks, 
We cleaned our trucks every single day. I've never cleaned vans more in my life. Right? We used to practice client interaction in the shop. He would make us go pretend to ring the doorbell and look the client in the eye and talk to them. And he had a script for us to say. Right? We weren't selling, but we were serving. And it's very much the same thing. So as a 15-year-old, I'm getting practice on how to talk to multi-million dollar home clients, right? All of us did. And then he had something that was amazing. He, had a, he, had, he used to give us two Ziploc bags for every single job. He gave us one because we had a leave, be, leave it better policy. We had to find a rock in the driveway, a leaf on the lawn, something that was out of place, put it in the bag and deliver it to him to show that we made that property better than when we arrived. And then we had a lost and found bag. Anybody ever clean a pool skimmer? What goes in a pool skimmer? Paper clips, pennies, quarters, right? Usually meaningless stuff. He would make us anything that was their property, bag that up, wash it off, and go ring the doorbell and deliver it to them. And say, look, we don't take your property off the site, right? Even if it's a penny, he wanted us to give that to him. Why? Because he's showing how honest we are. Right? That was the goal, because nobody else would do that. They just throw it away or throw it in their pocket. Right? So all of a sudden, as this young person, I'm getting indoctrinated into what good service is by a gentleman who just understood home services, I think, in a way that a lot of people did not. Right? So why did we do all this training? Because he had, we had a lot of people. He's spending a lot of money to train us every morning how to ring the doorbell and all that. Because we worked at houses like this every single day. Anybody know who lived there? This is where his other house was. Yep, George Bush. So we used to clean George Bush's swimming pool every week. And I was lucky enough to, to go clean it most of the time. That was my route. President Bush would be out hitting golf balls at his neighbors, having a good time. Nicest man. But why did our company get to clean the Bush's house versus somebody else, right? Because anybody can clean a swimming pool. It's not very hard, but very few get to clean for the president. And that's why we did this. Dick Chrisman understood his clients. He understood what they desired. He understood what they wanted. And he knew that if he built a brand that seemed so much better than all the competitors, that we could charge basically anything we wanted. So when we'd go to Bush's house, it was the easiest route for me. Kind of Bunkport, Maine, one of the richest places on earth in the summer. I would just be cleaning every single house along the coast. We had them all, right? Because price for that client is not the issue. The service is the issue. How we behave is the issue. How we look is the issue. So but before we talk about that, we need to talk about you, right? Because a lot of us are not Dick Christman. And we're not commanding the high price. And we're not cleaning for the president of the United States. We have to talk about why we started a business to begin with. Right? Why do we start a business? Because we dream of going on vacation and fishing on a Tuesday at noon, or going skiing or biking, or hanging out at Little League practice in the afternoon and making gobs of money and not being at the office, right? Is that the reality, though? No, not for many of us, right? The reality becomes we start this business and then we become a slave to that business. We work in that business seven days a week, 12, 14 hours a day because we don't charge enough. We can't afford to hire people. We need to learn the skills like Dick taught us to be able to charge those high prices. Right? Lack of money is a nightmare. Right, we can be the greatest cleaners, the greatest restorers in the world. If we're not getting paid, our life is not fun. Our life is not good. We need to have profit, real profit. Ed Cross is in the, office, in the house. He talks about that all of the time. We deserve to have profit. Well, how do we get there? Especially on the cleaning side, it starts here. It starts with our mindset. You deserve to have money. You deserve to have a comfortable retirement. You deserve to have a nice vacation. You should be able to buy nice stuff. If you want the, if you want the nice snow machine, Scott, you gotta charge high prices, right? So we have to make sure that it begins between our ears, that that is where all of this starts, 
with our mind. If we don't believe that we can sell at high prices and that we deserve it, we'll never get it. That customer will sniff us out in a minute. I'm not paying that person. They don't even believe they're worth this price, right? We have to know our value and know what we're bringing to the table. Chet, how much do you charge a square foot for cleaning carpet? It starts at $1.29. All right, starts at $1.29. There's probably very few people in this room that start at $1.29, right? Why? Because Chet's cleaning has done the work. They have figured out how to get that George Bush type client so that they can then put on a show for that person that that person values that at $1.29 or more. We have to do the same thing, right? I have an electrical contractor that I coach every week. Master electrician, 30 years in the business. Left a big company, went out on his own. He's a technician and he's an awesome technician. And he was charging $255 an hour for his expertise. So he's not really making much money. And I was like, hey, what do the big box guys charge? 700 bucks an hour. And I'm like, do they send a master electrician every job? Well, no. I'm like, so you're a master electrician with 30 years experience and you're charging 255? And they're charging 700 sending a kid? Pretty much. I'm like, okay, why was he at 255? Because that's all he believed he was worth. He didn't think he could get 260. Right, so over the course of a year, I got him to keep raising his price a little bit at a time so it didn't freak him out, and he got to $435 an hour. What's that math? He went from 500 to 710 doing the exact same amount of jobs. Right, because there's only him. He's a one-man show. So would you rather make 500 or would you rather make 710? I'll take 710 all day. Right? I'm going on a vacation to Hawaii. So all it was was that he didn't believe that he could get more than 255. Right? Starts in his mindset, right? Now let's talk about our clients. What do they want? What doesn't your client understand, Scott? Cleaning and restoration? They don't know a thing about what we do. They don't know anything, right? They figure that every single restorer can dry the house, every single cleaner cleans equally well. We all know that's not true, but in their mind, they have nothing to judge it from, right? But what they know is how they feel about us and how they feel about us in the home. And that's gonna dictate the price. So, whoops, I got ahead of myself, right? So here, here's the thing, how well do we communicate? How well do our 23-year-old technicians communicate with that $5 million homeowner, right? Is it fair to send them to that front door without training? No clue? No, we need to train them how to communicate. Do we seem trustworthy? Do they feel good about us in the house? We train that. Did we look them in the eye when we spoke to them at the front door to make a good impression? Do we seem excited to be there? Does it seem like we even want to serve them? All right, it's a big deal. How do we smell? Last night's beer and a half a pack of Marlboro Reds, is that what we smell like when we walk in? That does not get you paid, right? I don't care if you smoke, just don't, don't smell, smell like smoke in the house. Right? Our guys used to smoke like this outside the van, trying not to get on the shirt, right? Right? We want to be smell neutral. We don't want to be full of cologne and perfume. And we don't want to smell like Marlboro Reds. We want to smell like nothing. Right? That way, we're going to do it. And do, this is the most important one. In our industry, still, most technicians are male. And a lot of times, the only person home is a female. The most important thing we can do that will affect our price is how do we make them feel safe in their home? How do they feel like they want us to come here and do a good job for them, right? Instead of being nervous and like, these guys look sketchy, I don't know about this company, right? That's never gonna get you paid. So, if we don't do these things well, it'll all come down to price. Ed Marcioselli at the Seal, I don't know if Ed's here. Ed always said, it's always about the price until you make it not about the price. So our job and where we're gonna move forward from here is how to not make it about price, right? Now restorers, I know that's slightly different for you. That's a different ball of wax, but you can still take the same lessons that we're about to go through to build your brand 
to make sure that you're getting good reviews and that the plumber who referred you is getting good feedback or the insurance carrier or the TPA or whatever. It's all about the show, right? Larry, Larry's gonna, pat, we're gonna send out this slide deck and then some other stuff. Larry's gonna put a clipboard going around. If you're interested, just drop your name and your email. We'll send it to you, okay? And if we don't do these things well, it's a race to the bottom. Let's see who can have the lowest price. There is no shortage of people who are cheap, right? So most markets, you have this many companies who are racing to the bottom to see how low that price could go. And then you have a few companies at the top battling it out for whatever price they want. I don't know about you guys, but I'd rather be in the few that are battling it out for the top price. That's where I want to position myself. But I have to deserve to position myself there. I have to look the part, act the part, talk the part, walk the part for the client to believe that. This is theater, right? So we need to make it not about price. How? All right. I'm a control freak by nature. Everybody that knows me knows that. I want to control what I can control. I can't control traffic for my technician driving there tomorrow. I can't control the economy. I can't control who's president. I can't control if my clients are having a good or bad day. I have no control over that. So what I want to do in my company is I want to control what I can control. And we came up with these four things in our company. We used to call it the guts program. Grooming, uniforms, trucks, and shop. These are four things that I have absolute control over as an operator, and I want to make sure everyone in my company is on point with this. Because if I can do this, I can now raise my prices. Okay? So let's talk about grooming real quick. General cleanliness, right? What we talked about. Don't smell like, you know, two bottles of Axe body spray. We don't want that, right? We want to be neutral. Neatly combed hair, fingernails and hands clean. I mean, that's relative to us, right? We're doing work, but it doesn't mean you can't take some wet wipes in the van and try to get your hands a bit clean before you can go shake the next homeowner's hand, right? We want to smell neutral, no body odor, teeth brush, fresh breath, neatly trimmed hair and beard. Right. So these are things that we controlled at the shop. We ke we kept oops, sorry. We kept razors, shaving cream, toothbrush, toothpaste, deodorant, all that. We kept it in the cabinet and our morning huddles, Larry or one of the managers would walk around and if Scott's smelling a little ripe, we're gonna hand him discreetly a thing of deodorant and say, why don't you go to the bathroom and put that on, right? Why? Just like at Christman Pool, I'm putting on a show for my high-end clients, or any client for that matter, right? I wanna control how it's groomed because these two people in this multi-million dollar house have expectations. And if we want to mimic that expectation as closely as we can in our trade, right? We don't want to seem so different than them that they can't relate or they're scared of us, right? Uniforms. This is Any Hour Plumbing. They're in Utah where I live. Anybody know Any Hour Plumbing? Yeah. 1,400 employees, by the way, right? When you go around Utah, you just see swarms of red vans and guys with white shirts and black pants and every one of them looks perfect all the time. And they're plumbers, right? I mean, you, they don't look like plumbers. Well, there's a reason they grew so big, because they look like the high-end clients that they serve. That's why they have 1,400 employees. Amazing company, by the way. Everybody should go check them out, right? Who gets paid more? No, who would you pay more? <laughs> What if the guy on the left is actually a way better technician than the guy on the right? Would you still pay him more? No, you're not going to because that doesn't fit the mold of a high-end company, right? Chuck in a truck is always going to command a very low price because they don't even look like they're trying. They don't look like they deserve $1.29 a square foot versus 29 cents, which is probably closer to the national average for carpet cleaning, right? They're always going to pick Paul the Pro on the right. They're always going to be willing to pay that person more, even though he may be nowhere nearly as skilled, because that doesn't seem good to them, 
right? The cutoff shirt and the jeans and the dirty hat will not allow you to charge a lot. We have to change out of that, like, hey, I just rolled out of bed and let me throw on whatever and go work, right? Trucks, A1 Garage, Tommy Mello, $250 million garage door business. Every single truck in all his 21 locations look just like this. Clean, neat, Dan Antonelli at Kick Charge made this wrap. He does all the best wraps, to be honest, I think, in, in the industry, in the trades, right? And why does Tommy want this to look good? Because everybody keeps seeing those nice vans, well wrapped, and all of a sudden they're like, that's gotta be a quality company. You know, look, garage door companies don't scale to $250 million. It's like unheard of, right? But he figured it out. He's doing all the same stuff we're talking about today, day one, right? Anybody ever uh, have somebody show up at their house with all the dash trash? <laughs> you gonna let them in the house? My wife's sitting in the audience. Yana won't let you in the house. If you pulled up to her house and she saw that, she'd send them home. Why? Because if that's what your van looks like, that's what my house is gonna look like. You are not gonna take care of my place. If you can't even keep yourself and your van clean, what are you gonna do on your job site, which is actually my home, right? So we wanna be cleaning vans every day. This is the stuff that makes us more valuable to people. It doesn't seem intuitive. It seems like, well, if I just do the work really well, I'll always get paid more. It's false, it's not true. Looking the part is what helps get you paid, right? And then the shop. And everybody always says, Eric, why the shop? Nobody comes to my shop. Nobody cares about the shop. I've never had a client at my shop. But how we do one thing is how we do everything. So how are we gonna have a messy shop and then expect our team to go out and have clean work sites? There's no way, there's too much disconnect. Right? So we have to get everybody buying into the fact that we do everything right. We do the grooming right. We do the trucks right. We do the, you know, the dashboard trash right. We do our shop right. And if we do that, we start feeling that we're more valuable. We start feeling that we're worth the money. And that's crucial to getting paid. Right? I mean, we could sit and talk about sales tactics all the time to try to get more money on a, on a bid. But to be honest, these things will do that for you. Right? You don't have to be a super amazing salesperson if you're getting these things right. That leads us into now we are at the time of job. And business is theater, guys, right? I never wear a jacket unless I'm here. Like, I, I'm in like shorts and t-shirt every bit. But if I'm at work, I have to put my uniform on. I have to look the part that I deserve to be up here. But it's the same in every one of our businesses. We have to look like we deserve to have the right to serve those clients. To do that, we have to do what Dick Chrisman did when I was 15 years old and practice talking to the clients, practicing where we park, practicing what we say, practicing how we look. Every job is a stage, and every technician, every project manager, every estimator is an actor and actress in that play or movie. We have to recognize that, right? So we wanna, we wanna manage this. This is all stuff that we have control over as long as we take control of this part of our business, right? So let me walk you through a little bit. This doesn't matter if it's a restoration job or a cleaning job, right? First thing we're gonna do, we're gonna insist that our technician do a pre-call. Why? I wanna make a good impression for that client. I want to let them know when we're gonna be there. I wanna do some other stuff. I wanna make a little bit of connection before I get on site. So by the time that our guy rolls in, they're already like, this is awesome, right? So in our company, we used to give every technician's van a Starbucks card. And they had the ability, we asked them every single time you're gonna to go to a new call, you know, if I'm rolling out of the shop after the daily huddle, hey Scott, it's Eric with Shamrock, how you doing? Oh, I'm great, hey. My GPS says I'm about 30 minutes out, so I'm about to leave the shop in five minutes. I'm heading your way. I'm gonna stop at Starbucks and grab something. Would you like something? Why am I doing that? I'm trying to make a good impression. I'm letting them know when I'm gonna be there, and I'm offering them something. 
Why am I offering them something, especially if I'm going to go do a bit on carpet cleaning? Because the law of reciprocity, if I do something nice for you, you're going to want to do something nice for me, right? So I can't tell you how much easier this pre-call makes your technician's job for the rest of the day because when they roll into every job, the client's already is like, these people are so nice, they offer me coffee. By the way, almost nobody ever takes a coffee, very rarely, right? But they're all very appreciative that you asked. Right? That's that theater part that we're talking about. Where to park? Scott and I were having a conversation when I was walking up here that nothing worse as a client when somebody will, and just pulls in the driveway. Right? That's my house. I pay the mortgage here. You don't get to park in my driveway unless I give you permission. Park on the street. Ideally, in line with the front door and the front window so they can take a look and go, oh, Scott with Pioneer Restoration's here. Right? See your nice van, your Tommy Mello van. Right? All of a sudden, they're like, yeah, this company's on the ball. They didn't block me in. They're not going to leak oil on my paving stones that I paid 80 grand for. Right? You have to do these little things. Practicing front door interaction. Practicing with your team a little bit every day. Hey, this is how you ring the doorbell. This is where you stand. This is how you address somebody. Male customer, male technician, stick your hand out to shake. Female client, leave your hand down unless she puts her hand out. She might not want to touch you. Right? These little things, they add up. And they add up to higher prices. Right? Doing a good inspection, educating them, acting like a consultant and not like just the carpet guy or just the restoration guy, right? We want to be more than that because then we get to charge more, right? Pre-job education, making sure that they understand everything and all the realities of the job before you begin because if you tell them before, it's education. If you tell them after, it's an excuse. We don't want to be in the excuse realm, right? And then property protection. I'm so big on property protection, whether it's a cleaning job or restoration. I will actually, even if an adjuster is not going to pay, I want more property protection. I, that's, that's a way for me to put on a show that that, comp that person is like, these guys take such awesome care of my home or awesome care of my business, right? Go a little hot, go a little hard on the property protection. It helps, right? And then rehearsal and role play. You know, when you go to a concert, do you think they just kind of got up there and winging it? Like, oh, hey, the, the fireworks went off, I should jump or whatever, right? Like, no, they're sitting in an airplane hangar for six months doing it every single day so that it looks totally natural by the time you get to the concert, right? We have to practice. We don't have to practice for hours. We have to practice five minutes a day every single day, something along those lines, right? But we got to role play. And then for the cleaners, Okie dokie. I don't know what happened. Is there anybody here that can help me out? Yeah, oh. I think I'm moving the uh, screen too much. All right. Rehearsal and role play. Full house inspection, right? Technicians don't love selling a lot of the times. Give them a tool to help them sell. Build an inspection sheet, right? Because if I said, hey, Jacob, Go in that house and sell everything you can. You're like, oh, I don't know what to do. If I said, hey, Jacob, here's a list of everything that we could do in this house. And actually, we went into Service Monster or House Call Pro or Service Titan, and we wrote the last time they cleaned their sofa, the last time they cleaned the tile, and bring it up to them. Go do an inspection. Tell them what kind of shape it's in let them know hey i don't know if you know scott but they haven't you haven't cleaned yourself in four years all of a sudden boom add-on sales are happening right and it's a very low stress way where's levi levi your team's using this every day right that's levi's sheet by the way and uh how's it working that works great and it is as much for the client as it is for our technicians there you go Perfect, right? Have a system, create a system to make it easier on your people. And look, if you're an owner operator and you're honest with yourself and you're like, hey, I'm a way better technician than I am a salesperson, which is a lot of people in our industry, find tools, use tools. I'll send you something like this. Use the tools that make your job easier for talking to clients. Use a brag book. Larry and I had brag books in every van, right? Looked like that on the front, had all these little tabs that showed restoration, tile, carpet cleaning, whatever. 
had a little, you know, had our Yelp reviews printed in. We had hundreds and hundreds of those. Oops, in my head. Had a little bit of history about our company, right? And we used all pictures from our technicians' phones. So every, there was no like, I stock photo pictures in there. It wasn't the highest quality thing. And we would tell people that, like, hey, I know the pictures are a little grainy, but just so you know, every one of these pictures of our carpet cleaning, of our tile cleaning, of a restoration job, they're from real jobs. This is what it looks like when we come to your house and do this, right? So a brag book goes a long way. And for the technician, it gives them space. Hey, why don't you take a look at this while I go do the inspection and get 10 minutes alone so I, I can think instead of the owner talking to me the whole time, getting flustered. It's tools. So let me ask a question. Can this young man on the left effectively communicate with these high-end clients without proper training? You think? Good kid, right? That, that, that picture represents every technician I've ever had. In Southern California, I never had anybody from Yale or Harvard come and apply to be a water damage mitigation technician or a carpet cleaner. All of my, all of my team, mostly male, didn't like school. A lot of them came from single family homes and tough neighborhoods and underfunded schools. Right? You can complain and be like, well, that's not my fault. They're not my problem. Yeah, it is. They're yours now. They're our employees. We have to train them to be able to walk up and ring that doorbell and effectively deal with that client, right? Because a lot of our team, they feel really good ringing the doorbell and doing the work. They're very afraid of these two people, right? Because they don't feel that they're enough. They don't feel that they have the training or the skill set to really talk to that person, right? If we can't get them there, we can't sell at a higher ticket average. We have to get them so they feel confident going and ringing that doorbell, right? If I can get that young man to learn and understand himself and what he's good at and what he struggles with and what his communication style is, <laughs> and then I can get him to learn how to read these two fine people, right? So I, he knows himself, and he kind of can figure out who they are. He can turn around and sell to them, right? Because he can communicate. How do we do that? Well, Larry and I use DISC. There's all kinds of things. There's Myers-Briggs. There's Wonderlic. DISC is easy because there's only four things, not 16. My technicians are not going to be able to dig deep on 16 personality types, but they can identify four. If I can teach them the difference between a D, an I, an S, and a C, and be able to read that, when they go to see that client, they're always speaking that client's language. Right? Scott's a high D. Scott's a client, if you haven't figured it out. Scott's a high D. And Scott wants the best, and he's not afraid to spend money. So if I go and I can recognize, hey, Scott's a high D, I'm just going to cut to the chase and tell him what the best thing is, Scott's going to turn around and go, sold, right? You know, whereas if I had a high C personality type, very analytical, slow to move, lots of questions, don't believe anybody, need to proof, that's going to be a little bit of a different sale. I can't approach them the same way as I would do Scott. If we can train our people to do this, we're winning, right? Customizing the message to the client in the style that they like. And it doesn't take very long to figure out what that style is if once you know DISC, I can make more sales. I can make higher sales because I'm always speaking to that person on their terms and the things that they care about. Right. If I can do that, I'm winning. The bonus for the employees is they can use this information with their kids, with their husband, with their wife, with their parents, at the grocery store checkout line. Right? They can use it everywhere. And that's a huge bonus. Right? Next thing, selling packages. I hate yes or no propositions. As a salesperson, I don't want to be at yes or no. I mean, I understand there are times when things are yes or no, but if I can avoid that at all, I'm going to avoid it. If you look at an industry like HVAC, why do they scale so fast? Everything's in a good, better, best, right? There's something for everybody. Every single call matters. I don't want to walk out of any calls with a zero call, 
No zero calls, no zero days. I want to sell something to at least get my foot in the door, right? If we're going to do that, we have to teach our team how to think a little bit like a lawyer, Ed. <laughs> what does what is law school train you to do? Think and be a few, a few steps ahead of everybody else mentally, right? Is that, am I way off base? Yeah, that's the attempt, that's right. Yeah, so if I'm gonna go do my awesome sales presentation, and I'm gonna be getting those clients involved, and I'm looking the part, and I have my brag book, and I've got the whole thing, and I'm killing it, right? I'm like, this is easy, right? And all of a sudden, there's awkward silence. They're thinking about it. And then, you know, the old saying goes, whoever buys, whoever speaks first buys, right? Well, I don't know if I agree with that. But at some point, somebody's gonna end that awkward silence, and I need to teach my team how to do this, right? So we would teach this. Hey, Mr. and Mrs. Jones, I can see you're sitting here thinking about this. And if I ask you a question, if price was no object, after all the sales presentation that I've done, do you think our company would do a good job for you? Right? And if, they're probably gonna say yes, right? If you've done all the things that we're talking about, they're gonna say yes. Okay, so what do I do? I got them to have an affirmation with me. They said yes to something. They think I'd do a good job. Okay. Hey, do you mind if I ask a follow-up question? With a company with the same reviews and the same quality and the nice vans and all that, do you think their price is going to be very much different than mine? Right? Now it's a moment of truth for them. Most of the time they're going to say, no, it's probably about the same. Great. Which package would you like? Right? Or Joe Crisera at Service MVP would say, so what should we do? Right? Sometimes people just need a little bit of scope to the whole process to get them to move to the next step, especially S's and C's on a disc. They're not big risk takers. They need to be fully convinced that they need to buy. Right? These are the things that Larry and I were constantly talking to our team about. We were training this every day. Look, in Southern California, I'll talk about restoration for a second. In Southern California, it was very common for me to roll up to a new loss and there's four other restoration companies there, right? So what are we doing? That homeowner called their plumber, they called their agent, they called their next door neighbor, they called everybody and I show up and there's a yellow van, a green van, a brown van, every van and me, right? What are we all doing? We're fighting for that job. Whoever sells best wins. I'm gonna win that every single time. These are the th types of things that we were talking about with our team to get to yes. Because not everybody, all the work comes through program work or all the work comes from TPA work where you roll in and it's your job. There are still people out there fighting for every job and you have to make sure your team is going to win those. Right? As an independent in Southern California, Larry and I had to fight for pretty much every job we ever got. Right? We had to learn how to become good salespeople very, very quickly. So, I know you guys want to go to lunch, so I'm going to try to do this pretty quick, right? So we can help, except for having the screen up. There, there we go. So we can help. After Larry and I sold our cleaning and restoration business, we started Super Tech University because what we recognized was so valuable about our team and how we could take this kind of band of misfits that we all were and create a system to get everybody trained so they could go get five-star service experiences. I'm just going to not move anymore. Hold on. We come back? Okay. I, it's all me, guys. I'm playing with the... Uh, I'm fidgeting with the um, thing. So yeah, so we, we have a video skill development product called SuperTech University. It's both for owner operators and multi-truck. Look, there's plenty of owner operators who you still need to work on your skills. Just because you're in the company doesn't mean you're dialed and everything, right? You could be better. We could all be better, right? So SuperTech University, 1,700 lessons currently and rising weekly. Um, Mondays we do personal development, Tuesdays we do job site behavior, Wednesdays we train DISC, Thursdays we do sales and service training, Fridays recap of the week, and a five question quiz. If they do that for six months, everybody's entitled to 14 CEC credits with the ISCRC. 
right? So you can get your people trained five minutes a day at your shop and not have to send them halfway across the country to get, to get certified, right? And that's the thing. What is Kobe Bryant, what was Kobe Bryant doing every day? Practicing foul shots. What was Michael Jordan doing? Same thing. What was Tiger Woods doing? Practicing putting every single day. That's what super tech is. It's putting for your team. It's doing this little bit of practice every single day, right? Daily micro learning. Anybody know Kevin Bunce? Other than Scott? Yeah, Aaron? Yeah, so Kevin started with us four years ago and I don't think he's ever missed a lesson once, every day, right? Kevin started with about 12 people when he started with us. I think he has 50, 55 employees now. Sold the business to private equity. Supertech University is a huge part of their day. Actually, I went there once and did a live lesson. And then I, I said, thank you. And everybody there just sat and waited. And I'm like, okay, we're done. You know, like, why is everybody just staring at me? And then uh, nothing. So one guy raises his hand and he goes, you need to say it so we can roll. And I'm like, say what? <laughs> right? like, I had no clue. And apparently at the end of every Super Tech video, I tell the guys to have an awesome day in the field and they'll see them back here tomorrow. That's their like Pavlov's dog. Like as soon as I would say that in the video, they roll. And everybody just sat silent and stared at me. Super weird. And I didn't even know I said it. So um, yeah, it's, it's a habit, right? Most of us like rituals. Most of us like habits. Most like structure in our lives to do a little bit of the same things every single day. Right? So what do we have? We have training for owners and employees, daily technician videos, we have weekly CSR videos, we have weekly in-home sales, weekly service manager videos. Anybody ever take a really good technician, promote them to service manager with no training and it blew up in their face? Other than me? All right. I got sick of doing that, so we started doing service manager training. So before we made them a project manager or a field crew chief or something else, we're already training them on how to deal with people. And then we also, you guys can get a monthly call with me just to make sure that we're implementing right. So we're only going to sell eight discounted memberships. Normal fee is $447 a month. That's for your whole team, no matter if you have two people or 200. But for the experience, we're going to be doing $199. And then you will be locked in on that price forever. So, and as your team gets bigger, we don't charge you any more money or anything like that. And um, we got one, two, got a bunch of people in here that use us. Chet uses us. Chet, what's the what's the biggest? Every time I walk over here, it goes down. What's the biggest benefit? Scott, what's your take? The difference in communication in my dad's business training, um, what's this here, Wednesday? Wednesdays. My gosh, the ability to take the guys from any background they're coming to me from and get them to communicate with each other so much better, get them to be able to communicate with their clients better, get them to communicate with me better. Because I'm such an extreme D, I want to give it word, but my God, it's going to get done. But by learning this, uh, how do you feel about that? What if we have this goal? How do you think we should get there? That training is valuable. Yeah. Yeah, and Scott's been with us for two years, year and a half. Started at 975 when we started, and now he's probably going to hit 3 million this year, right? So, in addition to that, some bonus. But wait, there's more, right? <laughs> 
So, uh, yeah, give you a copy of the book, signed copy, just come by the, if you sign up, just come by. Um, hour free call, right? I charge 475 an hour for, for a Zoom call. Happy to sit down and help you in any way I can. And then two free tickets to a two day planning retreat at our home office in Ogden, Utah. We have this multiple times a year. So if you sign up, you can come at any point during the year. We sit down for a couple days and just do really deep work on ourselves and our business, right? You'd be happy to have him come. And um, you could do that. Our next one's October 31st and November 1st. Larry yelled at me for having a retreat during Halloween. I didn't know it was. So anyway, that would be a $1,298 value, right? We're going to do $199. That's good for the eight. And then if anybody just wants to see Larry at the back of the room, if they want to sign up, it's first come, first serve. Real quick, we have a couple minutes. Any questions for anybody? I said all that for an hour and you guys don't have any questions? Chet. I think the number one tip is building a system, right? So like Levi's guys didn't want to do it either. But what we did is because we knew that they didn't want to do it, we sat and made a system. Like most technicians like to talk about what they know how to do, right? They, if you ask them a technical question, they'll happily give you the answer. So I'm gonna build a system where I have like an inspection sheet that I can give them and it has every single thing that they do. Ideally, you're using your CRM and leveraging technology so they know when the last time it was or if they've never done it. And then all the technician has to do is say, hey, do you mind if I walk around the house and just do an inspection? There's no obligation, there's no hard sale. I can just tell you the condition of all the things that you have. And then if you see anything that you'd like to do, we can add it on, right? So all of a sudden they're, they're in their wheelhouse. It still feels technical to them. And now the customer has the ability to go, well, I actually want my sofa done, or could I do a demo? So I think it's trying to create a system. And then there's other things at play, right? If you have on-time appointments, well, well, the technician's gonna rush and try to, they don't wanna feel rushed to the next job, so they're not gonna upsell anything because they're like, I don't wanna be late. So it's having windows of time so that they feel like they have time to actually sell and then, move on to the next one. That was the number one roadblock for us. I kept talk, trying to get my guys to sell. Nobody was selling. And I was like, what's going on guys? And finally they're like, well, if I sell a sofa, that takes me 45 minutes, which is gonna put me late for my next job. And I don't wanna get yelled at. So we started doing a one hour window, then a two hour window. We ended up with a four hour window that would overlap. So our technicians could just go boom, boom, boom. But if they sold something, they didn't feel they were gonna be late. I don't know if that's the case for you guys, but that's a big stressor for a technician. Yeah, go ahead. Scott. Why do you make so much money? I'll tell you why. Because I've been coming to this show for 20 years. We used to actually shut our whole company down, rent vans, and bring all of my employees here. This show, if this show didn't exist, I wouldn't be able to stand here right now. So when Michael Balzano asked me to speak and asked me if he could, we could do something nice for the show, I said, well, I can lower my price for this show only so that we can do it. And look, I want people to be successful. And if, you know, if there are owner operators in here where 447 is just not doable for them, but they can pull 199, I still feel good about that. That's the reason. Do you have a question? I, yeah, well, you know, it, it worries me a little bit because I feel that more and more is being asked of us for less and less. So a lot of contractors are going to be skimping on training because they're like, we got to go make money. And I feel that I feel you know better than me, but I feel that for us to do a good job and stand out, like say in a TPA program where everybody's graded, right? A lot of the grading is coming from how the customer feels about it. So, I mean, my feel about where the industry is going isn't always a good one because I feel that it's more metrics and less service. And I think that there will at some point be a backlash to that, probably. If 
if I was going to be a betting man and say there's a backlash, then I want to train my team to be able to be on the forefront of being the best. And look, guys, here's the other side. There's another side of this coin beyond what Ed said. When you train your team how to think, how to read people, how to understand people, you like going to work more because they're more self-aware, they're easier to manage, they're easier to work with. You're building a team together in your daily huddle. And if you can do that, if nothing else changed other than you still like coming to work every day, you're still winning. Right? Larry and I, when we started doing this training, we're at a point where we hated to go to work every day because it was just like trying to rein in chaos all the time and everybody's emotions and everybody's feelings and everybody's angry all the time. And you know, for any, any entrepreneur, that's demoralizing. That's demotivating. You know, we didn't get into it because we only had an hour. One of the things that SuperTech does is it keeps people working at your company longer. Average mitigation technician stays in the industry, how long? Eight months? Is that roughly right? A year? Whatever, a year. So if I'm turning over a mid-tech every year, and it costs me roughly one and a half times their salary to replace them and retrain them, I want them to stay longer. I don't want them for a year, I want them for three years. If I can add to that person's life, because this program, the stuff that we believe in, is adding to the personal life of our people. If we care about them and we make their life easier outside of work, they're gonna be more inclined to stay with me, right? If they stay with me for three years instead of one, I make more money. My life's easier, I like coming to work more. Did I answer your question, Ed, at all? Great presentation, by the way. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thanks, Ed. Right. Last question, Levi. So, this is just more of a comment related to what you were talking about. And when uh, people come to our company, it used to be one of those things that you walk in, you know, for a while, they may stick around, they may not, they leave the same exact person they came in. Now, when you go to a company, All of your checks are in the mail. <laughs> All right, thanks everyone.